Okay, welcome to Math for Electronics ET 111B. I'm Art Eggers, and I will be your instructor for the course. In this sec first section here, Lecture 1, we're going to look at actually um, all four chapters for the section known as Review of Arithmetic Fundamentals. And we're going to go back and take a look at everything from decimal systems, using the powers of 10 within the decimal system, units and prefixes, and fractions, decimals, and percents. So we're going to move quickly through this because this should be all material that you learned back in probably about the up to about the eighth grade and into the ninth grade if you took uh, high school algebra. So all of this stuff, although you may be rusty, it should be stuff that you have in fact seen before. So in chapter one, we're going to concentrate on the decimal number system learning or relearning how to use decimals and decimal fractions, whole numbers, the fractional portion of the decimal, rounding, significant digits, and using the operators addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. So in the objectives, we're going to go back and look at developing or redeveloping our understanding of the decimal system how to read those values, do some conversions using the operators, sign numbers, uh, and rounding. So the decimal system means exactly, deci means 10, so 10 digits. In this case, 0 through 9, and then we start over again starting at 10. Each digit is a weighted position within the base 10 or the, pla the place value system of base 10. This chart, to start with, you need to ingrain this into your memory. You need to have this at your fingertips. If you don't have a copy of it handy, make a copy of it and keep it handy so that you can continually refresh yourself until this becomes second nature. Because this allows you us to look at the weighted system. In this case, 24 is telling us that if we look at this section here, the, the chart tells us tens we see that 2 is in the tens position, so that becomes 2 tens or 20. If we look at this number, 5,264, the 2 now is in the hundreds position, 5,264. In this one, the 7 is in the tens position. It means that there are 7 tens or 70 represented by that position. This table becomes handy, again, if you're going to keep anything else handy as a reference to remind yourself uh, what we're looking at in terms of operations or operators in the arithmetic systems. When looking at fractions, we have to determine what the numerator is, what the denominator is. The little line between it we call the vinculum. This becomes important when we look at decimal fractions because in this case we're looking at the whole number 10 in the denominator. Okay, So the denominator 10, in this case 7 tenths, in this case 1 tenth, 2 tenths, 3 hundredths, 1 thousandth, 12 ten thousandths. Okay, so we're using the 10 values. Later we're going to convert those to exponents and um, make it a little easier to read. And then later we're going to make it in, make them into the metric notation. So we need to be able to read this very fluidly. Four thousandths, four over one thousandth. Ten five tenths, twenty-seven hundredths, twenty-seven thousandths. Okay, so in this case, we get used to reading with factors of 10 in the denominator and whole numbers in the numerator. Okay, and we will start using them as decimal numbers. In this case, 47 thousandths becomes the value represented as 0 0.047, the 7 telling us that we are looking at thousandths. In this case, 423 thousandths could just as easily be represented as 432 divided by what? 10 to the third or 1,000. Keep track of the rules in your textbook. Rule number one in dealing with conversion of decimal fractions to decimal numbers determines by the value of the denominator. So we go back to that representation, 17 divided by 100, 17 hundredths 
then or the decimal relationship 0 0.17 is 17 hundredths. Rule 2 then says convert decimals to decimal fractions. Determine the position of the rightmost digit. That becomes the value of the denominator. So when we look at this, the rightmost digit in this case is a 9. It's in the thousandths position. So this becomes 39 thousandths. Whether you deal it with handle it as a decimal fraction or a decimal number. Your text has lots of examples. I suggest you, you go through the examples as you are reading through your text and make sure you understand thoroughly what this example is trying to teach you. You can learn everything you need to know by working through the examples and then later working through the problems. Key points show up. In this case, the first one says mixed numbers are numbers that are made up of a whole number part and a fraction. We use the AND to determine where the decimal point is. So 13 AND 36 hundredths then, we use the whole number part fractional value fraction itself, and we can see it becomes 13 AND 36 hundredths. Okay, again the chart, the chart is something that we need to be used to and very familiar with. Whole numbers and fractions then, Work through these examples, make sure you see how we convert from the fractional portion to a fractional representation. In rounding, the rules are generally anything a number greater than five, we round up. Anything less than four, four or less, we round down. So in these examples, if we want to round to the nearest tenth, we have a five, so that's telling us round up. The nearest hundredth, we have a three, that means round down. The nearest one thousandth, we have a seven, round up. Okay, these apply both for fractions and whole numbers. Okay, an example here, to the nearest one hundredth, to the nearest one hundredth, then this becomes 1274 to the nearest one hundredth. To the nearest tenth, three is next to the tenth, so that becomes a round down. To the nearest one, seven is next to the one, so we round up to the next value. And the same thing with the tens digit. In rounding whole numbers, remember that in rounding whole numbers, the zero is a placeholder, but it cannot be dropped. If a zero exists in the rightmost position, as a result of rounding, the zero is dropped because it's not accurate. The last section here that we'll talk about is significant digits. Key point, significant digits or significant figures, you can use them interchangeably, are the digits in a number not counting leading zeros that are known to be accurate. So the term significant digits is used in conjunction with the process of rounding with significant notation. So here we can see the example 0 0.04. 4 is the one significant digit in this representation. The 0 to the left of the decimal point um, tells us there's no whole number part. The second 0 is important because it states there are no tenths. So neither of the zeros are considered significant digits. In looking though at trailing zeros, the rightmost zeros, are considered significant digits when to the right of the decimal point because their presence indicates a known accuracy. So you have to be mindful and aware of these digits when you're dealing with trailing zeros. So in this case, 52 with the two trailing zeros makes all four of those significant digits. I know it can get confusing, but it's something you just have to remind yourself of. Go back to the rules if you get confused. 5,000 here, though, has four significant digits, but it may be ambiguous if it was rounded up to the nearest thousands. This could have been 4,735, but it was rounded up to 5,000 and has four significant digits. So if we look at moving the decimal point as we do in this example, you can see that four significant digits remain the figures that are important 
in maintaining the accuracy of this number. Okay, getting used to what is the most significant and the least significant digit, MSDs and LSDs, usually it's pretty simple. The first one to the left is the most, the smallest one to the right is the least significant digit. So we can take this number, 79,630, and identify each of its weighted positions and determine from this what is the most and what is the least significant. This is stuff that just you just have to be aware of because when you are doing calculations, these are things that become important. Okay, so for maintaining accuracy. So the next section, addition and subtraction of signed numbers, we'll stop here. Okay, so continuing then um, using uh, signed numbers, addition and subtraction um, in chapter one. Um, this representation of the number line is a good way to get used to understanding um, positive and negative numbers. We use this representation um, a lot. When we teach the, uh, when I teach the physics class, this becomes very, very important um, in understanding things like displacement. Everything to the left is negative. Everything to the right is positive. And you move along that number line accordingly. Um, the absolute value, very important, especially when you're dealing with values that you cannot have a negative number represented. You use, like you see here with the five, with the two bars on either side of it, it tells you that regardless of the sign, your answer is going to be a positive number. Rule 1-4, addition of values to add numbers with like signs, add the numbers and fix the sign to the answer. Add numbers with unlike signs, subtract the smaller from the larger. Rule 1-5 for subtraction, change the sign of the subtrahend, add and follow the rules in 1-4 for addition. See the example here, minus 2 plus a minus 3, it gives us a minus 5. We've moved entirely on the left side of the number line. In the next example, minus 6 plus 7 plus a minus 9, sometimes it's easier to rearrange the terms. You can do that. Not going to, it's not going to hurt anything. So I'm going to put the, the two negative values up front, minus 6, minus 9, which gives us a minus 15. Then I'm going to add 7 to it, which gives us a minus 8. Sometimes it just makes it easier to do. In subtraction, we call the first number the minuend, we call the second number the subtrahend, and then the difference then becomes the answer. Multiplying and dividing, rule six says when you're doing multiplication or division of signed numbers, if all the numbers are positive, the answer is positive. If there's an even number of negatives, the answer is positive. If there's an odd number of negatives, the answer is negative, okay? Refer back to that rule often. In terms of signs, multiplication signs and division signs, um, we can use the cross, we can use the dot, and we can actually use parentheses to denote multiplication. On the division here, we can use the slant, slanted line, the divisor sign here with the uh, line and the two dots, or we can use a negative exponent, and we'll learn more about that as we go along. So the rules here, make sure you have these understood and ingrained in dealing with multiplication and division and how we assign the positive and the negative sign. You can change denominators as reciprocals and the same rules apply. We'll get to reciprocals later. It's important to understand the order in which the operations are performed. You have terms and expressions. A term is a quantity preceded by a plus or a minus sign. An expression is a quantity denoted by one or two terms. So you can see below here, four plus seven, two terms, all in one expression. In the second one, we have four plus seven times three. So we've got an expression containing two terms. One of the terms actually is the seven times three. Rule 1-7 says, unless otherwise directed by other mathematical operators, such as a parentheses, a mathematical expression can be simplified by performing math the math multiplication and the division first, then do the subtraction. So if you look at the first example, you'll notice 6 times 7 plus 4 times 2. We've got two multiplications there. Do them first, and then add the two uh, products together. 42 is the product of 6 times 7. 8 is the product of 4 times 2. 
So you can see the same with the other two examples. And looking at parentheses, again, parentheses denote math, um, multiplication. Parentheses are kind of used as a direction or an order. Parentheses are mathematical symbols that can be used as a mathematical expression to direct the order or the sequence of performing calculations. So in this case, 3 times, in parentheses, 4 minus 5. 4 minus 5 is done first, although we've got a multiplication here. We could multiply 3 times 4 and 3 times 5, and we'd get, what, 12 minus 15, and come up with the same answer. But in this case, we can do what's inside of the parentheses first, simplify it to minus 1, multiply it times 3, and we get a minus 3. In complex technical problems, we often have terms within terms. In, in programming, we call this nesting. So we've got nested here a 5 plus 3 in parents nested inside of the 3 plus 9 times that value. So we reduce the problem down. I always recommend using this fashion, using a uh, a vertical rather than a horizontal scheme going step by step by step down the page as you are solving your problems. So in each step 5 plus 2 is reduced to 7, 9 times 7 is reduced to 30 to 63, 63 plus 3 is reduced to 66, divide that by 5 and you end up with your quotient of 13.2. Using parentheses, brackets, and braces, um, again, other forms of nesting. Sometimes it keeps the problem in the order of execution or the sequence um, um, a little more understandable. So in this case, we're going to put within the brackets 5 plus 2. Now we simplify that as 9 times 7. And now we within the parentheses, 3 plus 63 which gives us 66, divide by 66 by 5, we get the product of 13.2, and then we add, <coughs> excuse me, add that to get the sum of 22 and a half. In this example, again, we're just doing, doing an order here by looking at the, the brackets and the parentheses. So you can see we've got 4 times minus 6 within the brackets, so we can solve that first. We get minus 24. Take the sum, gives us minus 22. Pos negative and negative gives us a positive. Add those two together, we end up really with 22 minus 3, which gives us 19. So parentheses, braces, and brackets become valuable tools for making sure that we are following the correct order for the operations. Next, we'll go to chapter 2.